Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the continuation of that which you began with us. We pray that it will still please your heart to continue to bless us with your presence. Grant us understanding. Grant us illumination. Speak, Father, through your word to us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Turn your Bibles with me to John's Gospel, chapter 19. And I'm hoping you've noticed so that I don't fall into the category of men of God. I've taken off my jacket. Okay. John 19. Let's listen to the word of God. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. In Latin, Pilate declared, Eka homo, this is the man. Behold the man. So if we are talking about biblical uh, manhood, the standard is one, Jesus Christ. Do you notice what Pilate said to, uh, uh, to the crowd about him in verse 4? He says, I find no fault in him. Pastor Abutu just talked about justification. Before you can be the man, you must be justified before God. That's the only way God will find no fault in you. That's your point where you start to even begin to grow into manhood. He says, I find no fault in him. And leading up to that, did you see what the man went through? They scourged him, they mocked him, they spat on him, they pulled his beard, they did all manner. The one in whom there was no fault did not utter a word. Do you know that something James said? That if you can tame that the tongue is what? The smallest of our members, right? that men have been able to control titanics. Just yesterday, I went to my principal's place and he just came back from the US and he was showing me some magazines. He said he knew I would love them. He brought some magazines, this magazine called Life Magazine. You won't find them, you may not find them now. The editions, one of the editions was 1938. The others were 1943, 1944, 1945. And this was about the period of the war, right? So in one of them, there was this, uh, the, is it USS, what is it called? The, that enormous ship that is as big, almost as big as this whole estate, where planes take off from and all of that. Man is able to stare such humongous machines. But it takes a man to be able to control his tongue, to know when to speak and when not to speak. But the testimony of Pilate was, I find no fault in him. And ultimately, he declared, behold the man. That is the standard. That is the standard. And so everything we'll be looking at now should be driving us towards that standard. As Ephesians 4 tells us, although speaking about the unity of the body of Christ in general, but you will see that it uses the metaphor of manhood to depict maturity. And it says to, that we come to, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the gold standard. 
Behold the man. And our sis pro, while he was yet with us, said something somewhere. He said, when God decided to change the world, he became a man. There's an enormous responsibility regarding manhood. But we thank God that we have the help of the Spirit to be able to do and become that which he has made us to be. Now, as we start, let me just cast our minds back to what I had said in the first session, that the attack on manhood is not principally an attack on man per se. It is first an attack on God through the philosophies and the thinking and cultures of men. And that is where what Paul said to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, where he says the weapons of our warfare are not, uh, are not carnal, right? But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, etc., etc., dismantling every thought of man, philosophies of men. Now, if the war on manhood begins and is perpetuated through not carnal means, but the thoughts and philosophies of man, then it also stands to reason that the materials for corrective redress and address of faulty manhood is not going to be kinetic. Are you with me? So we would also need to depend on the weapons and the materials that are not essentially carnal towards bringing about corrective measures to a manhood that is continually becoming deformed and debased. So, Pastor Abutu, you, you, you almost preempted quite a lot of, you know, what is coming, which for me is very heartwarming. It means that we have not been working at cross purposes, although we only spoke once or twice in the course of when this. So we said that one of the first issues was the denial of objective truth, and we saw the consequences of that gender fluidity, identity crisis, effeminacy, etc. But we want to propose what the panacea, the corrective, biblical corrective, for a world that says truth is no longer objective, truth is now subjective, or that truth cannot be known. Which means we can't even know God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So any man who says you can't know the truth lies to you. We know him. We can know him. He has made himself known to us, revealed to us by his spirit. So the first biblical corrective, you started with it that men who can, a man is telling you um, that, you know, come, 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 and you nothing, no, no plague will come near freedom from accident, freedom from arm robbers, but he has bodyguards. And people are not thinking. So the first corrective is that for you to be a biblical man, you need discernment. Discernment is of utter importance. A lack of discernment, therefore, is a clear mark of spiritual immaturity. If you look at Ephesians 4 and verse 14, Paul writing says that we henceforth be no more children. And he goes on to tell you the peculiarities of children. Being tossed how? To and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The picture you painted there, everybody, the ones you say they are under, how the medical doctors, to quote you, could be under the spell of that young or those young people. Nothing derogatory about age, but sometimes a lot of them are not literate enough. Of course, definitely not biblically, not theologically. But even in terms of the things of the world. You see professors and doctors and military generals who control troops come and bow the knee to people 
who, as it were, hold them bewitched through falsehood. Why? The absence of discernment. The absence of discernment. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. In 1 John 4, 1, he tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but do what? But test the spirit to know if it is of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2. Test how many things? Everything. Even that which we are, by God's grace, sharing now. Be ye like the Bereans. Now I'm speaking the Christian is called King James. I'm saying you should be like the Berean Christian. Who having listened to Paul, as Pauline as Paul was. Paul is like, I heard um, Brother Abutu say that by God's grace in December, Brother Conrad Mbewe will be here. I am sure there are people who, ah, it's Conrad, who, whatever he says. No, no. Do not be into a true man of God will even be happy that you subject his teaching, his preaching to scrutiny. Yes. That even grants him opportunity to enlarge the scope of the work in your heart. Because sometimes when you preach and teach and teach and teach, say, are we together? And people, you wonder, I hope these people are not in their hearts secretly, secretly saying, mm, I better let him do and go. But when there is somebody who raises an objection, not to be obnoxious, but because they truly want to get to the kernel of what you are saying, it's always a welcome blessing. So what I'm saying, should Brother Conrad eventually come here, when they give you your your conference pack, don't remove the notebook and throw away that this one, there's no need to write any question now. Everything he says, no. The scripture says, test everything. Now the thing again is, biblical man, how do you test what the preacher is saying if you don't have a basis of comparison within you to cross-check. Or if you don't have the habit of doing like the Bereans, Scripture says, the first of all received the word of God with readiness of heart, right? So they didn't come with a, a skeptic disposition. Oh, they were happy to go hear the word of God. But having done so, they went back to cross-check if these things were true. That's Acts 17 and verse 11. It says, the brethren in Berea were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they subjected everything to scrutiny. So the first corrective so that you don't get somebody tells you today, come, that um, it is around two, between 2 and 3.30, that, you know, the demons used to, so we are going to ascend to the third or second heaven. We are going to, see, come with your spiritual chains. Tonight we will bind the devil. And you too, you are losing sleep. You are going to, to, to carry a spiritual chain to go and bind the devil. You have to be discerning. That is what marks a child out and separates men from children. Henceforth, be ye no longer children being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The other day I was driving with my wife and when I say the other day, it's not the other day, the other day, it's like some... Um, a month or so or two ago, when there was fuel scarcity. So, you know, when you're on the queue, you'll be forced to see all manner of things. 
So I now looked up and there was a billboard, one of the churches. <laughs> so I told my wife, oh, it is now no longer um, crossover service from December to January. There is now a service to cross you over from the first half of the year into the second half of the year. And people are trooping there that there is a blessing that God has that comes in the middle of the year. And if you miss it, it means the rest of the year. Meanwhile, they crossed you over for 12 months in December. <laughs> to, it sounds, you see why you are laughing? There are people who would hear you laugh and they will take strong exception to what their daddy said or their papa said or their bishop said and you are laughing at it. You know the difference? Hopefully the difference is that you are discerning they are not. We need not laugh at them. It gives us another sector of the field where the gospel also needs to go. There are churches that need the gospel. Members in churches who need to hear the gospel. So I can't emphasize this enough that the first corrective the first corrective is that men need to be discerning. Discernment. We need it. We need it. Discernment goes beyond just studying, just reading. I go back to the example of um, um, who was that? A. Philip, right? The one that met the Ethiopian Enoch. Philip, yes. No, God just pew, took him like that. And the question he asked the Ethiopian Enoch was what? Understandest thou what thou readest? There is a place for referencing and for quoting scripture which you yourself don't understand, but you can say it. You, while you were introducing me, I don't know why you had to do such elaborate introduction to the point that you said I have a parrot. Yes, I have a parrot. The parrot speaks. The parrot calls names. The parrot says what, I don't know that it's he or she, but in the house we, we collectively decree that it's a he. So, so that's, that's, that's that. Mm. The parrot does all of that, but does the parrot understand what it is saying? No. So while last the parrot calls every member of my family, including me, by name, the name he hears us, he hears being called, I don't think there's an association between the name and the person. Because there are times I pass and I hear, Sekemi, can you? Baby G. You know, in different voices. You know? The parrot doesn't know that. So there is a place for someone to be able to regurgitate, to be able to recite. Oh, yes, you, you are preaching. Oh, yeah, that's uh, 1 Corinthians 19. To, mm, yeah, yeah. But what does that scripture mean? Not to you. What does the scripture mean whether you exist or not? Because, you see, we are, if, if you now begin to do that, what does the uh, brother Eliezer, so uh, Psalm 91, uh, verse 5, really, what does it mean to you? What's the revelation you are getting from that? From that? And you begin to wax, and you see? You know this word of God, eh? <laughs> There's a way you look at it in the morning, and it will be like this. <laughs> when you meditate on it at night, you see that the Holy Spirit will be showing you something totally different from what? That's a lie. All scripture has one meaning. It may have a thousand applications, not a problem. But you need to understand what script. The question is, what did God say? What does God mean? How can I now apply this to my life now? Because the word of God is ever living. Corrective number one, discernment. If we need to, we'll come back to this, but so that uh, Eliezer doesn't raise his hands at me again. Okay. Now, we looked at other issues. We talked about the rights movements, which has birthed human rights, and now it is as though man is now a god unto himself, 
men will decide that this is the right they want to have and the states will back it up by legislation. We have also feminism, which is a movement, like our brother said, that, agreeably speaking, is the product of the effeminate man and the toxic man coming together. And in response, in opposing response to that, feminism, you know, took over. Although I would say that Feminism perhaps even started in the garden when Eve decided to sidestep or front, front, uh, frog leap her husband who was complicit. I think the ESV gives us a clearer picture because growing up you hear that story and say, Adam, where were you? Adam was there because the Bible says, and she gave her husband with her to eat. He was there. But a laid-back man allowed the wife to take the front seat. And here we are now. Rights, which has given way to gay rights. And I don't know why they call that union gay. How, when I was growing up, to be gay means to be a happy, cheerful person. But now you can't tell somebody, ah, I feel very gay. You can't. You can't. You can't. And then we also have child's rights, where now the state legislates that the child now can set agenda for the parents. That's an aberration. That's an aberration. That's an aberration. Fathers must be fathers and leaders in their nuclear families. Then, because we are going to take this one, uh, which is um, the second issue, we'll take the third issue the, and the fourth one. I'll read them out together. So when, when I start talking about the correctives, the correctives will apply to issues two, three, and four. Then we also have the issue of systematic male emasculation as encouraged also by culture and by the state. Uh, while talking about this, we said there's an affirmative action, you know, positive discrimination. Men suffer that a lot, you know, uh, out there. And, um, and for those of you who know people in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Western world, I'm not talking about Ikiti and Undo, I'm talking about, um, you know, the U.S. and all of that. You know that in a marriage, everything, legally speaking, is skewed towards the woman. So that, that's why we keep saying, you see, when we are talking of manhood now, manhood does not, like we said, when we're using the example of the, the lecturers, marrying doesn't make you a man. You become a man, and because you're a man, that makes you get married. It's not that, eh, that's why some say, eh, don't worry. This one that he's behaving in response, when we marry for him, he will settle down. It's a lie. He will continue. So what we are saying is, because amongst us here, we don't know who will be going where tomorrow. We've had brothers who have left us, some for the US, some for Canada, some for other places. You choose foolishly your wife. If you don't choose your wife as a biblical man, Go and find out the statistics of the number of Nigerian women who, when they leave Nigeria with their Nigerian husbands or the ones that the husbands either send for them in marriage or they come and marry them and take them there, when they get over there and they see how the law and the system is skewed in their favor, they put the man's life in misery. I hope you're aware of that. Complete misery. Some of them even use children as another means of livelihood. Why? Right? Because the moment there's a child, until that child is 18, right? The man, no matter what he's doing, must be paying child support for the next 18 years. So if you can have one child now for the man, you give a gap of maybe three years. At least you are sure that the next 36 years, you know, you, are, you have a steady income. This is not for you. I know people who are going through this. But let's not start from, okay, that's what that system 
is foisting on them. Let us start from how did you choose your wife? What were your parameters of choice? Did you choose the way a biblical man will? Somebody that each time you say, okay now, sister, let us pray. That's when she says she wants to go and make indomie for you. No, no, no. There should be a red light somewhere. There should be a, a red light. Your parameters of choice, the indicators of wife for you as a biblical man should be different from those of the men of the world. True or false? We've talked about how the system also grants children rights beyond their, their, their parents so that a father cannot correct a child. When scripture says, spare the rod and you spoil the child, yes, there's a scripture that says the rod of the, but there is a place for the real rod, my dear. Because mischief is bound up in the heart of a child. That's what scripture says. Mischief is bound up and you have sometimes to flog it a little bit away to see come back, but until they get born again, you have to, you know, help the... Right. And then the fourth issue, which we said, was the reactionary default knee-jerk response of men to how it appears as though society, culture, and state has ganged up against them in favor of women it's either like Brother David said, one of two poles. Sometimes the men become so withdrawn that they become almost insignificant in the scheme of things and, becomes, and become effeminate. Or in blatant um, opposition to being pushed against the wall. Like they say, if you push a goat to the wall, right, that it can even bite. They now become chauvinists, misogynists, and all the other, uh, you know, high-sounding high, high, high words. And we've looked at in the last session how this agenda of toxic masculinity is also pervaded by the media. We talked about Nollywood, we talked about Hollywood. The, you know, you see Arnold Schwarzenegger, one man, you know, or any of those Rambo. Immoral when you see the standards in the film, but he alone will enter Sambisa Forest with one gun, will kill a thousand people. You know, that's the man. That's the man. No. So we would offer the biblical correctives to this. But in doing so, let us read from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16 will read Come on. First Corinthians sixteen, thirteen and fourteen. I read. The King James Version says, Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Now, as I read this, these are different um, commands or challenges within the same sentence. The first is, watch ye. The second is, stand fast in the faith. The third is, quit you like men. The fourth is, be strong. And he goes on to say, let all things, underscore all things, be done with charity. Charity is not the name of a person, that's soul King James for love. Meaning, let all that you do be done in love. That's what the ESV says. So let us look at those things that Paul has just asked that the biblical man should do or should be. The first is a call to prayerfulness. And prayer is not, see, there is, you know, the Lord said in the model of prayer, Matthew 6, 
um, that when you want to pray, do not pray like the hypocrites, right? The difference between you and the hypocrites is that the hypocrites, like the Pharisees, rather they pray so that men would see that they are praying. This is a corner piece, right? Yes. Uh-huh. So you can see this house from there, from there, from there. If there was a road here, you see it from there. Why? It's strategically located. And the Lord said of the Pharisees that they like to take strategic positions where when they start praying, everybody would see them. But it says, you, when you pray, get into your closet and do what? Shut yourself in. Because your Father in heaven, who sees in secret, will reward your obedience and call to prayer openly. That said, Paul again also writing by the Spirit of God says, men everywhere at all times should pray, right? There is the example of Nehemiah who was before the king and was um, sad in countenance when he was, I think he was the, the wine bearer, cup bearer, right? Yeah. And the king said, ah, how come? Why are you so sad? I've not seen you like this. And he said, why won't I be sad? When the breaches of um, the city and the temple were broken down, and the king asked him, so what would you have me do? What did Nehemiah say? Did he say, excuse me, king, and then ran somewhere? He said, while he was communicating with the king, he did what? He was praying. It is possible to pray as a Christian, as a continuous. The other time in church, in our church, uh, local church, we were saying that the same way your mind is never inactive, It's either filled with worries, it's either filled with some things that somebody did or it's filled with expectation or it is filled with the match that they may be playing today by four or so. I hope people's hearts are not going there. We are here. here. But the point, the point I am making is just as your mind is always working, that thing that you could give your mind to always walk in could be in prayer to God. If you don't even have anything tangible to say, it could be a prayer of thanksgiving to God. So he calls us first to be prayerful. That's where he says that we should be watchful and stand firm in faith. Two, rooted in Christ, loyalty. Our loyalty to God our loyalty to our king, our loyalty as members of the body of Christ to the head of the church should begin with our loyalty to one another. How many of us can truly trust our brothers in church? Do you know that there are some secrets that unbelievers who are our friends know about us that our brothers in church don't know? Why? You can't trust them. You can't trust them. I was listening to some interviews that was granted to um, a particular media outfit. They were interviewing um, successful um, CEOs in the world, you know, men who have made it in the business world. And one of them was asked that if you were to pick somebody you know, you know, different CEOs have their angle to different things. Like there is a man who said leadership. When people have defined leadership and all of that and all of that, and they asked him what for him leadership was, he said leadership is what happens when you are not around. That's why you're able to travel to Zambia and you know that the church is not going to close down. Why? That means there's leadership in the church. Other men will tell you that um, if I want to employ somebody, I'll employ a brilliant person, yes, but who is lazy? I say, why? He says, because if you give him a task, Mm -hmm. he'll do it just once and make sure he doesn't come back to do it again. Yeah, he's that lazy. Because of his laziness, he's going to dedicate. He doesn't want to come back. He's not the kind of person that you give him a task on Friday. We'll do it in such a way that you call him Friday night. Oh boy, you must come back to the, you must be in the office. No, no, he will do it so that you don't call him again. But in this instance, what the man said was, I will not go essentially for skills, not even knowledge, not even that. Those things are important. But what I put on the top of the list is loyalty. If you find a man who is loyal, even if he doesn't know half of the theology, 
and the pastoral skills you have, he doesn't have, but he is loyal, you'll be able to hand over the church to him. Whatever it is, if he makes mistakes, you know when you come back, you review his, his actions and you will help him through. But you get a man who knows at par with you or even knows better than you, that's the, that's the one, that's the one. But you can't trust him, you won't hand over anything to him. True or false? Loyalty. Rooted in Christ. Loyal to the call of the master. But that loyalty can only first find expression in our loyalty one to another. Like I'm asking the question again, you don't need to <laughs> answer me. We all have secrets. Yeah? We all have secrets. But how many of you, I mean secret, secret too, not uh, there are some things you want to say are secret and you call the brother to show him how close and you tell him, Omo, do you know that I, I, I scratched one man's car and then I, I sped off. No, not that kind of secret. There are secrets which you'll be ashamed to tell the whole church. But do you have someone who is a brother in Christ with whom you are confident enough to say, bro, I have this problem. See what happened to me. Or see what I'm going through. Or see what I am thinking about. And I know it is wrong. Pray with me. Maybe some of us do. But I can bet you the majority of us do not. Why? Because we can't trust. Now that you have put the blame on your brother who is not trustworthy, ask yourself the same question. How many brothers have come to you to tell you secrets? If none has come, you are not trustworthy too. Amen? Amen? You see, when we preach like this, some people say, it's not, but you know, when the Bible talks about edification, it also has room. Because you see, men, as men, you don't talk to men, you talk to men with respect, but you talk to men in a way that would energize them to actually act as men. So it's not a, a period to come and, you know, pamper. It. Let's talk to each other one-on-one. -on -one. And if indeed what we are saying is true, we'll get down before the Lord and say, Father, help me in this. Help me in this, Lord. And he will help us. Praise the Lord. Act like men. You mentioned integrity. That's the third thing on my list. Loyalty goes hand in hand with integrity. Which means as men of faith, as biblical men, we must be sober-minded. We must present to the church the true picture of Christ. You know what Christ said? <laughs> he said, don't you know that if I wanted to, I would ask my father and he would send how many legion of angels? And they will come and set me free from here. But he didn't. He didn't. Again, that's going back again to being discerning as men. When people tell you from whatever pulpits or from whatever books you read that you have command of angels, now this is our month of putting our angels to work. Command them. Let the angels go. Wherever your job is tied down, your angel will lose. You don't have any rights, no power. Even Jesus himself said he would ask the Father to send angels to his help. But we have to show forth the integrity of Christ before the world. Turn your Bibles with me to Acts 27. I'm sure we know that story. If we're not familiar with it, we'll just give the context. This was when Paul was on one of those journeys where he was going to be you know, tried and all of that. Let me just read from verse 1. The uh, kernel of the reference is in verse 3. But to give it context, let's read from verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramythium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, 
The next day we put in at Sidon, listen to this, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be catered for. Do you see what's going on here? Paul was a prisoner. You know in those days, you who has been given charge of prisoner, if the prisoner escapes, what happens? They kill you. A life for a life. You go. But Paul's integrity was such impeccable integrity that the sent to a prisoner told him that you can leave the ship, Paul. Go into town. I know you have friends here. Go and sleep well. Eat well. Maybe the food in the ship may not be... When, when are you coming back, Paul? Around, around 6. Okay. But even if you come back by 8.30, there's no problem. But I just want you to, to go. Do you get the implication of this? Do you get the implication of this? Paul was such a man of integrity that the centurion was ready to put down his life that this man would come back to the ship. Did Paul come back? He did. He did. Integrity. Integrity. You have borrowed a brother's book and you have made it your memory of revelations. You've written all over it with red Bible, revelation, revelation, revelation. And when he asks you for the book, you are telling him the Lord hasn't finished dealing with me. With oh, how? <laughs> A man of faith, the biblical man, is a man of integrity. Let's look at the book of Judges, chapter 11. Judges, chapter 11. We all know the story of uh, Jephthah, right? Do we? Jephthah was the man who, when the Ammonites were um, a, 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 a fish bone in the throat of Israel, a thorn in the flesh, and he made a vow, right, to God, that if, because he had told the elders, right, that if I go and fight and win, am I going to, you are going to let me be um, your chief ruler, right, or something like that, said yes. But Jephthah made a vow to God. Let's read from verse 30. Let's read from 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, and then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hands, and he struck them with the he struck them from Aroa to the neighborhood of Minith, twenty cities as far as Abel Karimim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. Do we know how that story goes? What happened? Jephthah did as he had vowed unto the Lord. But let me just correct one thing. Reading that, you would think now his daughter was sacrificed, right? No, 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 no. She wasn't killed. I mean, again, that is why we say we have to be Men of discernment. If you read a story like this, or some man of God stands up and tells you, I need men in my church who can make sacrifices. Jephthah killed his daughter for the Lord. And I'm telling you to put down your, 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 your two month salary only. And you can't put it down. What kind of Christianity? I don't know. 
You should be discerning enough to say, God who told the children of Israel that they should not let their children pass through the fire of Molech, they should not do child sacrifice. When did God start accepting human sacrifices? You do like the Bereans, you do what? You go to scripture and search out the mind of God. And when you do that, you would see that what is happening here with Jephthah is what Paul, writing in the New Testament, refers to as offering up our bodies as a living sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter was not a sacrifice unto death. It was a sacrifice that she will not marry. She will remain a virgin the rest of her life, but will be serving as a virgin in the temple of the Lord. If you read that story down, you will see that the daughter now asks of her father, please give me time with my maidens to go do what? Bewail my virginity. Are we there? The point I am stressing from this is that Jephthah was such a man of integrity that the only daughter he had, because he had made a vow to the Lord, Jephthah kept his vow. And now you look at that from a different angle. Uh, <laughs> but if you are vowing, you should be vowing with your own life now. Now you have put the poor girl. You see, the daughter, read that story, submitted herself to what her father had vowed concerning her. Why? That man had shown exemplary fatherhood to that girl. And she knew that whatever it is, especially as touching God and her father, this man did it with good intentions on my behalf. Are we there? You see, when you begin to raise children, one of the signs of, you know, how well your children trust you, perhaps, is when you pick up the phone, son, where are you? Dad, I am... Please, please drop it. Just come. Come, meet me at... And the child doesn't start justifying your school fees that you pay by showing that he's a very rational... So, but that, why now? I mean, let me just... When you get to the point where your child, even if they ask you questions, it is not out of defiance, but for clarification, then you know that you have built real trust with your child. Of course, you know, it's possible for that young lady to have eloped. Yeah? It's possible. Because she knew the consequences. I will never marry. But all my life, I will have to remain a virgin, but in dedicated service to the Lord. The point we are stressing here is the integrity of chapter. How many of us have that integrity? Biblical manhood demands that you have integrity. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. It is not, it depends. It is not, are you coming? Mm, well, um, mm, it depends. Okay, when? Mm, let's say four for five. What is four for five? If you are coming by four, you are coming by four. If you are coming by 4.30, you are coming by 4.30. If you are coming by five, you are coming by five. Mm, then let's keep it four, four for five. You know, that kind. Mm. No. We need to be disciplined. It takes integrity to do that. And he goes on to say, do all things in love. Now, there are three components to that. What does he say? Do. The biblical man is not a passive. You know that love, according to Christ, is not a passive thing. He says, do. So God expects some form of action from you. Do. Do. If you say you have faith, let me see how your faith is actually seen. I can only see your faith. You know why we are here? I love God. I love God. I'm not saying those who are not here don't love God, but at least this is a measure of it. I love God. I love God. I love God. Part of that love is seen in how you pursue the things of God. You can't be absent from church for 
three Sundays running. There is nothing. You are not ill. Nothing. I just felt tired. But I love Christ, yeah? Mm. Then it's difficult to persuade anybody. That's not to say that it is those who come to church that will now measure love for Christ. But you get what I'm saying now? You can't love the Lord without being involved in his work. But you can be involved in the Lord's work without actually loving the Lord. True or false? Look at the building of the ark. Noah's ark. For those of us who know the dimensions of that ark and the length of time it took to build, come on. Recall there was Noah. There was his wife. We had his three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, right? And there are three wives. So, eight people in all. But in terms of the real hard lifting, you had just four men, right? Do you think four men would have been able to go to the forest, fell the trees, shave them, split them, whatever it is that uh, they do, arrange them, four of them hold beams that are maybe some, maybe about uh, 50? No. I believe that some of the people that Noah preached to, who mocked him for 120 years, who did not believe the message of salvation that would come only to those who by faith believed that it was going to rain, a flood, and that the ark was the only way out, just as the judgment of God is surely going to come and Jesus Christ is the only way to escape the wrath of God. I believe that some, if, yeah, some of those men would have helped in the building of the ark. There is no other way. Do you know the dimensions of the ark? So if there was something that was supposed to come from the top, how would four men, okay, let's say the eight of them, four women, the weaker vessels, I believe that some of those men helped in the building of the ark, but they never entered the ark. May that not be our portion. You are here. <laughs> you even bring tithes. Offering you are there. You take care of your pastor. You clean the church. You do whatever is necessary. But you are not in the ark. That will not be our portion. No. I'm talking like our people now, but I mean this one. Yeah. Right. He says, do. And he qualifies, 10 minutes. And he qualifies it. All things, not some things. Do all things in love. That's very important. Uh, Eliezer has spoken, so I have to <clears throat> I have to step up. Okay? About family models and family types. Where we said we have now skewed sense of manhood because the family, the home, is not the way God, generally speaking, intended it to be. You have homes where there are Two women, one is man, one is woman, or two men, one is a, a, a woman and one is a man, and all of that. Let's look at Matthew 19, read from verse 5. I think we, we won't spend much time here. We mentioned it in the first session, or rather the second session, my first session. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave, the ESV says, and hold fast to his wife. This one doesn't need any deep uh, expo expository discourse. It makes a clear distinction between the one who gets into marriage, a man. Marriage is not for boys. Marriage is not for children. And when I say boys, and when I say children, I am not saying that, okay, you now go and So when does one become um, a man, biologically. So, okay, I'll just wait. When I'm, whatever age they give you, okay, when I'm 26, I'll marry. Mm -mm. I am saying you need to be discerning. You have to have the discernment of a man. You have to have the maturity of a man. You need to have the integrity of a man. You are not, when you stand, you stand and you know why you are standing and for who 
you are standing. A proper understanding of the biblical concept of marriage is necessary for the biblical man to hold his home for the Lord. Because you know that the terminus of marriage is not so that just so that you make your wife happy. No. It is to reflect the glory of the unity of the Godhead, right? And to show forth the union and love that the Lord has for his church to the point he loved her that he was ready, not just ready, in reality gave himself for her. It takes a man to take this kind of stance. The last one, the parental pressure one we talked about when you decide as a man to bring up your child in your own image or so that he would fulfill the ambitions you had but that you couldn't fulfill, rather than bring that child up in the way of the Lord, you end up having a, a child who would be affirmation seeking, who may be bitter, and in the extreme cases may end up being a rebellious man. And that's not the kind of men you want to raise. So, at home, a man leads by example. I want to, Brother David did that excellently. Ephesians 5.23. And there's a command for husbands to love their wives, even as Christ. Brother David did that, so we'll move on. Two, at home or in the family, as a teacher, I mentioned this in the last session, that you can't outsource your spiritual responsibility to teach your wife or your children. And again, like he said, when Paul was saying, go ask your husband, there is a given that the husband ought to know. And please, because we are saying this now, like he said, if you don't know, don't try to wing it, and then you go and model up our theology. Be humble enough to say, give me time, let me go and, you know, uh, study that and you know come back. Maybe we'll do that our next uh, evening uh, conversation before we sleep or whatever. Don't just wing it and confuse and, and, and move on. No. We made reference to Abraham also. We are able to sing Abraham's blessings are mine, Abraham's blessings are Meanwhile, the blessing that God talked about Abraham was the promise of the spirit. Not the, the servants, male servants and maid servants and Abraham was rich in sheep and cattle and was rich in silver and gold that people are saying those are the blessings of Abraham that they are saying you know the true blessing God says will come through your seed and that seed is Christ and if you go to the book of Galatians it tells us that the promise that God made to Abraham was actually the promise of the spirit and when you have that promise operating in the true man of God. What you see is Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, joy, faith, and the rest of them. Like we were sharing in Bible studies the other day, and I said, I did um, a Google search of vines, because the Lord said, I'm the true vine, you are the branches, and my father is the vine dresser, right? And the one, the branch that doesn't bring forth fruit, what does he do? He cuts it off and throws it in the fire. But the one that is actually bearing fruit, he does what? He prunes it so that what? It will bear much fruit. What is the much fruit that the Lord is expecting from you as a biblical man? It is the fruit of the Spirit. And like I said, if you look at a vine tree with a branch that is actually bearing much fruit, do you know that you don't see the branch again? You don't see the branch. If you see the, this is a branch, right? By the time the branch is bearing real much fruit, you don't see the branch. What do you see? The fruits. So we get to that point where Ephesians 4.13 talks about the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ where you appear somewhere, you speak, and what people are sensing, what people are hearing is proof of the power of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That's a biblical man for you. Before you signal, the last point. Ephesians 6, 4. I was talking about this, but then half the time. And you fathers who are raising children who would become men, not just men, who would grow into biblical manhood. 
He says, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I was saying that we sometimes, you know, in our popular, say, ah, that guy, the guy provoked me. In fact, when I hear the thing, I provoke. You have already shown your bias to the word provoke. You think the word provoke is naturally a bad word, right? It is not. It is what you are being provoked to. So what Paul is writing to us fathers is that provoke your children, but not to wrath. And how you can see that you can provoke in good ways. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works. That's what I'm doing now in the last session. I'm just provoking you unto love and good works. Romans 11, 14. This is Paul talking about his passion for the Jews who were his natural bloodline. He said, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save them. So as fathers, don't say, no, I won't talk to him before I provoke him now. I won't. No! Provoke him to love. Provoke him to good works. What the scripture forbids you to do is that you shouldn't provoke him to wrath. I conclude with this. As I go back to John 19 and verse 5, or verses 4 and 5, Pilate said concerning him, I find no guilt in him. If you are here and before God you are still guilty, There is, I'm sure Pastor Butu will later do that, but it's my responsibility as the preacher for now. If before the courts of heaven, it can be said by the father of you, find no guilt in him, not on account of yourself, because you could never be guiltless before God, but on account of your faith in his son, who came, lived the life you couldn't live, died the death that should be yours, hung on the cross, naked, flagellated. Isaiah says you couldn't even look at his face because there was actually no face to look at. He says his visage was so marred, that is, he was so battered than any man ever alive. He took it for your sake and mine. And he died our death was buried three days. God confirmed that he had received his sacrifice because he was both sacrifice, offering, and the priest who offered it. He offered himself through the eternal spirit unto the Father, the book of Hebrews tells us. And on the third day, as a mark of and a seal of approval, the Father raised him again from the dead, giving us assurance that you put your faith in what he did life, death, and resurrection, then you are justified before God. Guiltless before him. Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. Can the father say that about you? And he finished by saying, behold the man. Eka homo. That is the gold standard of biblical manhood. And that is where, by God's grace, we are all moving towards. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your blessing upon us this day. Thank you, Father. Thank you. For in Jesus' name, we have rendered thanks. Amen. Amen.